let's move on. This is the last paper that I'm going to cover for GAN. And after this paper, you guys are going to be in great shape to do cutting edge research if you want to do or read cutting edge research of other people. This star GAN is very related to the cycle consistent paper. And over there, you were doing image to image translation, but you didn't have pairs of data, pairs of input output data. You just have two sets of images from one style and another style. And then you wanted to translate from one style to the other. Maybe you wanted to translate uh, Monet style pictures to realistic looking images or the other way around. Another application is that you have an input and then you want to make that guy have a blonde hair or change the gender, change the age, or make the skin color a different skin color. Or you, might, you want to make this guy angry, happy, fearful. If you want to apply something like cycle consistent GANs on all of these uh, tasks, then you're going to need to have multiple neural networks, multiple generators. One for the blonde hair, one for the gender, one for the aged, one for the pale skin, one for angry, one for happy, one for fearful, one for from going from one gender and change the age. So you're gonna have combinatorially many generators using that framework. Is there a way to get away with only one neural network? So that's the question. This is exactly what I said. If you want to translate from domain one to domain two, you're gonna need G12, that's one generator. And if you want to go from domain two to domain one, you're gonna need another generator, two one. So you're gonna need combinatorially many generators, combinatorially many neural networks. Can we get away with only one neural network, one generator? The idea is just to condition on the class, on the type of images that you want to generate. So as soon as you condition on the gender, that's gonna be extra input to your generator and that's gonna help you generate images that are for that particular gender. But let's see, we are gonna have a discriminator and once a discriminator is trained, you can use it to train a generator. It's the same framework as before. A real image goes in, a fake image goes in, your discriminator, which is a neural network, and that's gonna give you two objectives now. One is, is it real or is that fake? So discriminate between real and fake. At the same time, tell me what domain you are classifying. Just classify the domain for me. Are you classifying blonde hair, gender, age, pale skin, etc.? So that's your discriminator and you're gonna train it. And once you know D, you're gonna be able to train, it's gonna give you the last function that you're gonna need to train G. So the idea was condition on the domain that you're interested in. You have a generator, you're gonna condition on the domain and the input image. And let's say your, your input image is this guy and you want to output a fake image, the guy with the blonde hair. And that's gonna output a fake image. You can take that fake image and give it to your discriminator and your discriminator is going to tell you real or fake at the same time the corresponding class so the corresponding class should be the same as the target domain that you started with okay that's the loss for the adversarial loss and the classification loss and then we know that for cycle consistency because you didn't have pairs of data you needed to create pairs of data on the fly so you take your fake image and the original domain as the condition, you give it to the generator. It's gonna give you a reconstructed image. Now you're back in the domain of images. You're in the original input domain. Now you can compare these two images. So this is the idea of the reconstruction loss. Okay, that was uh, qualitatively, but in terms of math, what do we have? We have a single generator. We have the input image, you have the output image, and then you have the target domain label. And these are one hot encoded for blonde hair, for gender, for aged, for pale skin. So how, however many classes that you have. And then you condition on that target domain to generate your images. Your discriminator is going to tell you what class that image belongs to. Is it a blonde hair, gender, age, pale skin, etc.? So it's going to have an output here. And then it's going to tell you what is the source of this data. Was it real or was it fake? And then the loss of the discriminator is coming from an adversarial loss. 
It's coming from the loss of the discriminator plus a classification loss. The generator is going to have an adversarial loss here, is going to have a classification loss, and it's going to have a reconstruction loss. So if you want to write down the details, what you're going to get is the adversarial loss is coming out of the output of your discriminator, discriminating between real and fake. So there is a sigmoid here. But for the domain classification, you have a softmax at the end. The classification, you are maximizing the log of your likelihood. And there is a softmax here. It's giving you the corresponding class. And for each input, you're going to know the corresponding class. And that is for the real part, for real images. For each real image, you're going to know the corresponding class. For the fake images, you know what the corresponding class is. So you're going to give that as an input. You're going to say, I want to generate faces of angry men. And then the class should be angry men. Okay, that fake image. The reconstruction is L1. And uh, come in terms of the figure, it corresponds to this part of the figure. You generate an image. And then you give that generated image to the generator again to take you back to the original domain. Now you can compare X to X. So you're comparing apples to apples now. And these are some hyperparameters that you're going to choose. Before I go into multiple data sets, uh, is everything clear so far? What do I mean by multiple data sets? This is one data set. This is another data set. Now you want to combine both of them together. Sure. What seems, is the question? It seems that these... Um domain classification labels are non-unique. Like any image, the image in the top left of the, of the man with the brown hair, you could say they have like a, a gender label and you could say they have a pale skin label and you could say they have a, a non-blonde hair label. So I'm, I'm confused how that um, domain classification variable works. You said it was one hot encoded. Yes. So first of all, what is the data like? It's not like you have this same guy having two different types of hair, okay? So that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. In your data set, you have a data set of women. You have a data set of people with blonde hair. You have a data set of old guys, uh, et cetera. And these are not paired images, okay? So this is one data set of blonde people of different gender, et cetera. What you're going to do is you're going to one hot encode these. So if you are looking for coding, the blonde hair, you're going to put a one here, zero, zero, zero there. Okay. okay. If you want to generate female, that's going to be a one here, zero, zero, zero. So that's your one hot encode. And that's the class. That's C that is going in. Does that make sense now? Does that answer your question? Somewhat. I'm still, I'm still concerned. Like what if there was a blonde old person? That could happen, but uh, they're going to belong to one of these classes. Okay. in one of your data sets. Okay. But now the question is what happens if you have multiple data sets, like what you have here? You're going to have maybe two classes, two data sets, maybe celeb A and RAFD. You're going to have a mask vector, which is a one-hot vector again. If you are in the celeb A data set, you have a one there and zero for the other guy. So that's one-hot vector. And you can catenate it as additional input to your target domain label. These are one-hot vectors. These are one-hot vectors. And this n is different from that n, so don't confuse it. n here could be 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And n for the other data set could be 3. And if one of the data sets has less number of Cs, you just uh, assign 0 to the remaining entries. So you keep the same dimension. The dimension is going to be 4. And then you're just assigning a zero to everything else. In terms of training, you're going to do your usual training with the gradient penalty because you want these to be as close as possible to Lipschitz continuous. And gradient penalty, we know that is not the only way of doing it. And perhaps it's not the, it's not the best. And uh, by the way, these Y hat are samples that you generate between your generated images and real images on the fly and you have a gradient penalty loss. And if you want to compare it to a style to cycle consistent GAN, the other ones are not that good. So if you want to compare it to cycle GAN, it is slightly better, maybe because some transfer learning is going on from multiple domains. 
but there is a cost with cycle consistent GAN, and the cost is that you're going to need to have many generators. Here, you only have one generator. So you can think of this if you want to do, draw some analogy. The analogy to translation is that here you have multiple data sets of images. Over there, you have multiple languages. Okay, that's how you can draw the analogy. I think I'm going to stop here. And for those of you who have questions, I'll be around. And for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. I had a really quick question on this star game. Sure. Um, so just to confirm, it is possible to take an in input image and transform it into several domains. So by just feeding it into the generator over and exactly. over. Exactly. Okay. So what's going to happen? So all of these trouble that I went through was for you to just train your generator. Okay. Once the generator is trained, what's going to happen is that you're going to give it an input, an input image, maybe this guy, and you're going to say, you're going to input a one hot vector as well for the blonde hair, and then it's going to be able to generate blonde hair. If you change your one hot vector to female, that's going to turn that guy into a female, etc. Yeah, I think I meant if you take the males, the brown hair um, guy at the top left, go to the blonde hair and then take the blonde hair output and go to a different gender, then you have a blonde different gender. Yes, of course. Okay. So you can call your generator multiple times. You can generate this guy, but then uh, then this this could be your input. This could be the input that you can change the gender. Okay, that, that's very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is impressive. And Eating this is actually, I think there is an app on iPhone or your Pixel, Google Pixel, that you can actually do that. It's doing that for you. You take your image and then it's gonna change your age. How are you gonna look when you're older? So what's the question? I, I was gonna ask if, if you thought that doing that over and over again would eventually result in like a degradation of quality? Yes, probably. But uh, in the end of the day, there is no reason to doing it over and over again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there is, maybe you want to see if I were blonde and old, how would I look like? So yes, you're gonna lose a little bit of quality. But a couple of times wouldn't be bad, but maybe if you did it a thousand times, which is unlikely. Yes. And then I had one other question, um, which was from my understanding, you do some amount of training of the discriminator first. And no, then... that was just for me to explain stuff. Oh, okay. But okay. we know that the paradigm of training GANs is that you're going to do it in a consecutive fashion. Maybe a couple of iterations of this, one iteration of that, a couple of iterations or, of this. Or this two time scale thing. Or the two time scale thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. I just wanted to clarify then. Thanks. No, you do it in an iterative fashion. You're not going to wait for the discriminator to converge. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm saying, I thought, but I, I guess I had gotten a little confused. Yeah, but the way that I explained it was just to separate the concept of the training and the loss function mm -hmm. and the generator. Because what, what you're doing in GANs, in the end, you want to know what is your generator. Yeah, yeah, that's the goal. The, the rest of it is just for you to get good loss functions. Although I, I guess like an application of GANs could be to like identify fake images in the wild that were created adversarially for some reason. For the discriminator, yes, that could be one application. Okay, thanks. Yes, maybe you don't want to throw away your discriminator. Now that you, tr you trained it, maybe you can use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question in regards to okay. uh, the previous paper. This one? So I, I guess the one before that. Yeah, so um, when we go from Z to W, is it enough for the function to just be complex to make it more complex? Um, or does it have to be trainable? I guess I'm asking, is it trainable or is it just enough for it to make it more complex? Uh, this is actually trainable. So these are additional parameters, these fully connected ones. Mm -hmm. They have their own parameters and then you can learn them on the fly. And is there a reason that you want to learn them? Because I thought we just want to make um, Z more complex distribution. Uh, yes, but... Uh, you have two objectives. One is to make them complex. And the other one is for these Ws to have some meaning as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want this W to be correlated 
the distribution that you're putting on W, you want it to be correlated to the distribution of the generated images. Okay, that makes sense.